Hi, everyone. I'm Diana Delgado. I'm the literary director of the University of Arizona Poetry Center. And I want to welcome everyone to another episode of the Institute for Inquiry and Poetics featuring ambassadors from our Art for Justice initiative. The Institute for Inquiry and Poetics founded at the University of Arizona Poetry Center is a thought center designed to create space and time for poets to respond to pressing questions that reside at the intersection of social concern and poetry. Encouraging interdisciplinary modalities and investigative research, the Institute will ask poets a series of questions and digitally archive their responses on poetry.arizona.edu in addition to YouTube and the center's archive, VOCA. Today, I'm excited to host Vanessa Angelica Villarreal, Frank Johnson, and Raquel Salas Rivera as part of Art for Justice, a three-year project that commissioned new work from leading writers in conversation with the crisis of mass incarceration in the United States, all with the goal, goal of creating new awareness and empathy through presentation and publication. Before we begin, um, the University of Arizona Poetry Center must acknowledge that we exist on the traditional homelands of the Toona Odom, who have cared for these lands for centuries. As a guest in these lands, I want to acknowledge that we are an occupied Tono Odom territory. In, the, in our program tonight, each poet will read new work and after the reading, we'll be in conversation. Thank you everyone for being with us here today. As our first reader, I'd like to introduce Frank Johnson. Frank Johnson is a black poet, cultural critic and visual artist from East Las Vegas. He received his MFA in 2019 from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where his manuscript Literal Dope won the University Prize for Outstanding Master's Thesis. Frank's work has been featured in The Believer, Gen Magazine, Level Magazine, Los Angeles Review of Books, The Shallow Ends, The Rumpus, and Desert Companion. He has previously been awarded the Black Mountain Institute Donald Barlow Fellowship has worked as an editorial assistant for The Believer and currently works in collaboration with Jack Jones Literary Arts as a book publicist and programs assistant. Thank you, Frank, for being with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with both of you. Uh, I have so much admiration for Vanessa and Raquel. Uh, literally, I, one of my favorite readings ever um, at the market in Portland at AWP, both of you read, and it was, uh, yeah, so one of my favorite things. I just think it's so incredible. I mean, the language is so precise, right? The intersection of like social concerns and poetry. I think that's something that, um, one, to have like a really invested effort over years to collect work that is really directed towards this at a time where, um, people are, you know, there's an effort to erase social concern from poetry or to like, like sort of praise and uplift a poetry that is like detached from politics and social concern. Um, and so I think that's one of the, the many things about the effort um, at Art for Justice that is so inspiring and so exciting. Um, and again, to be here with incredible poets like Raquel and Vanessa, um, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, thank you, thank you again for having me. Um, so these uh, poems, uh, some of them actually came from that manuscript, Literal Dope, and they were revised and uh, I've been kind of uh, finding a way of reapproaching the work and trying to uh, take it to uh, where it needs to be before it comes out in the world. Um, and so, yeah, uh, these are the poems from Literal Dope. Uh, Trap, now, one. A device or enclosure designed to catch and retain or to kill animals, typically by allowing entry but not exit, or by catching hold of a part of the body. See also cage, see also shackle, as in, if an animal is caught in a trap, it will probably die there. Two, an unpleasant situation from which it is hard to escape, a trick by which someone is misled into acting contrary to their interests or intentions. See also respectability. See also masculinity. See also scarcity. See also white supremacy. As in, even an exceptionally smart or strong animal can fall into a trap. As in, genius is a trap. Three, residential areas with predominantly black populations that have been historically impoverished and blocked from fair access to housing, educational resources and jobs, redlined and HOLC maps and disproportionately patrolled by law enforcement. See also ghetto, see also projects, see also hood, as in the trap is home to too much genius that will probably die there. Verb, one, catch an animal in a trap. See also ambush, see also arrest, as in to trap you need a victim. Two, 
prevent someone from escaping from a place, have something typically a part of the body held tightly by something so that it cannot move or be free. See also red line, see also jail, as in when you trap something, you are the god of its movements, as in a good trapper knows they need only trap a single limb, the foot, the arm, the mind, anything will suffice. Three, extra legal activities necessitated by lack of access to sustainable wages, fair housing, affordable education and healthcare. See also slang, see also hustle, as in we trap in a trap because we trap. So my book, it opens and it moves through these sections where like, I'm really hoping to like redefine or to define some terms that have kind of defined my life. Um, and that like, you know, are so much, the language of hip hop and the language of the streets is like so beautiful because it takes these things that exist like trap or like, you know, dope and these other things that are so much a part of our, our lives and, and our, our lexicon and, and create entirely new meanings for them, right? Um, and so that's what some of this is hoping to do. CCDC, South Tower, sixth floor. The fourth time you get locked up, nothing comes by surprise. Not the cop who rips out your piercings or the cold smell of piss in the holding cell. You already know how the phones work and who to call. You know to talk fast. You've seen sunshine seep through the receiver and leave a man drenched in his grief. The fourth time you get locked up, you might try to pretend it's normal, like a long DMV trip. You might say things like, this happens to everyone you know who is black or brown. You don't waste time watching the door or pacing for warmth. You pull your arms inside your shirt and sit. You know you're gonna have to sleep. You know they're gonna keep you at least a week. The fourth time, you know the slow gray beat of captivity. You done learn so well the rhythm is drumming through you like a pulse, so low you don't feel it, keeping you alive. You're not picky about food because you know what choice you have. You take what you can, trade strawberry cakes like rose gold bricks and choose coffee and fruit and a pill to help you sleep for a day. The fourth time they take you, you know the dry expanse of consciousness and the oasis of dreams. You know no one knows why they are here or when they will be called. You know don't come back is a jinx and never just an empty promise. You know silence is a word you can keep Best to roll it up and quietly toss your blues. The fourth time they get you, you know well how society cages good and sick people and calls it just. How cages feel just like society to the people who fill them. You know we all find a way to live in our prison. We ignore the meals skipped, scream in traffic in the shower, scrap flesh for pride and survival. We spit blood and sacrifice. You know, CCDC is where they shoot cops. They film mm -hmm. cops at CCDC. And uh, a lot of the, uh, like most of, not most, I don't wanna say most, cause I don't actually remember the statistics on this, but I learned at one point that a lot of the uh, footage you see of people who are incarcerated is actually come from Clark County uh, Jail here in Las Vegas because they have like practices that allow cameras and footage and stuff. Um, mad interesting. If you watch 13th, a lot of the people there, they're from here. Mm -hmm. And to that note, um, you know, I like spend a lot of time, especially lately, you know, with all this shit going on. Um, you have like friends who are struggling, you have people who are good people, and you're like wondering why, like, why we are dealing with all this shit, you know? And I, I try to be a spiritual person. And and sometimes I really wonder if God fuck with me like that. And I mean, if she don't, who could really blame her? My prayers are hardly coherent, hardly consistent. Too many drunk texts, too many requests for someone who don't call too much. I ran out of words for God and I can't speak to my demons, but I hear them. My language is never as big as my sins, my grace, my demands, which have taken to lingering in the back of my throat. And who can say whether God has favorites, remembers only some of our birthdays. Maybe she's exhausted. Maybe she's a simulation. I never know what's real. I never know what to believe. I used to believe all I could have was the winter streets I kept returning to. Fades, funerals, and the familiar cold of county. And now I've made a home in uncertainty. My life is open concept. I let the light wash through undesigned. 
warm enough to mark up the mirrors. I am mostly alone and mostly unafraid, like a hummingbird at dawn. September flowers are pinking in my yard and on my father's gravestone too. I sense a revolution and many dead before spring. Ancestors way past impatient, embracing their kin in the sky. Ancestors way past impatient, embracing their kin. The sky was my lover. We laid all day with each other, tried to figure out how we could survive solo, just the two of us. And I don't know about you, but I can't say what any of this shit means. I know how to make a poem, make a thing pretty, and so must God, but I've been so ugly and so has she. And I swore when I wrote this poem, it would be all gold and saffron. Thought it would smell like some pine forest epiphany, at least some cocoa butter, at least an explanation, but these are just words. I'm not saying I don't believe in God. I'm just saying she ain't easy to read. She don't respond. She don't keep her red receipts on. I'm saying my cousin still can't come home and my homie still can't come out. And yesterday I ate lamb and licked the blood from the plate and laughed for an hour and everything was perfect. And it feels like a trick. And so we do this thing that we do, right? We like, we get up in the morning and we like, we just keep going, you know? We like put our feet on the pavement, we put our feet down and we do what we can do for the day. Um, and in the hood, we know, we say we 10 toes down. So I stay 10 toes down. I leave home in the 3.30 dark while the desert is still cold and breathe the clean dirt smell risen by the rain. I try to find a formula for the grind. Slide on my poor mans and skate six miles to work. Stash the extra work in the duffel and keep both eyes on the bag. If I make five at lunch, that's 50. Need 12 a day for the rent on the first. Can only afford four hours of sleep. I have gotten better at math than hoping the numbers will add up in my favor or even be equal. I no longer care how much my body must be taxed before I can be free. The bill is past due. And so like, if you think about the way that I'm hoping that readers will move through the work is like, a, like a five act or a three act structure and what really pushes you over because what really pushed me over at a certain point was like words, you know what I mean? It was, it was the word, the written word, the spoken word. Um, people gave me wisdom, they, they changed my life with words. Um, and so the definition, this new one, word and now. One, a single distinct meaningful element of speech or writing used with others or sometimes alone to form a sentence and typically shown with a space on either side when written or printed, as in a sequence of words is a sentence, as in the addition or deletion of a single word can transform a sentence. Two, a report of the news, as in where it is they gave cuz the maximum sentence, gang enhancements and shit. Three, a person's account of the truth, especially when it differs from that of another person. As in, my biggest fear is some cop's word against mine. Four, a private conversation. As in, judge in a rush, death banging my line, and I just need a word with God. Five, a promise or assurance. As in, I gave my word in blood to the east side. Six, a command or a secret signal. As in, just give me the word and I'm a slot. Seven, one's honor, as in, that's on my word. Eight, the Bible or other gospel, as in, the word will save you if you can listen. Nine, an affirmative answer used in agreement, as in, the word. 10, wisdom, essential truths. See also game, see also blueprint, see also crown jewels, as in, I just need a word. I just need a word. And so I go look for words when I can find them. And I think, you know, outside of books, you find them in your beloveds, you find them in music, you find them in, in art that speaks to you. Um, and I find a lot of mine in music. Uh, a lot of the, the work is not just the, the language of the streets and the language of hip hop, it comes from the, the music. Um, and so this, this next poem is called Salam Says. Um, 
Solange says, be leery about your place in the world. She warns me like my sister when she presses her cheek to mine, says, I love you, and sighs a prayer that leery is enough, that our survival be left up to us tonight. Like my sister, when she presses her cheek to mine, Solange says she's weary of the ways of the world, tired of praying our survival be up to us, and I feel that shit like the pistol in my jeans. Solange says, be weary of the ways of the world. They make niggas bleed like kings with no country here, and I feel that shit like the pistol in my jeans, an iron oath. They will not take me from my sister. They make niggas bleed like kings with no country, with no conscience here. I will not beg to flesh and bone for my own blood, my iron oath. They will not take me from you, sister. Be leery about your place in the world, she warns me. That's the first pantoum I ever wrote too, y'all. <laughs> I wrote that poem different and Jericho is like, make it a pantoum. I'm kind of mad he not here right now. Cause I was like, you made me write this. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but rest up, I hope he's doing good. Uh, yo, little man, where you heading? Don't you know you too small to be carrying all that brick heavy weight under your brick colored skin? Looking like you made a brick like everyone around here. You ain't the only one who got a block for a mama. Got building in your spirit like you built this country in some kind of life and have never been allowed to rest. You just like the rest of us. Come from bricks, from mud and clay and the last straw as far back as anyone can remember. We come from I can't take and no more from shoulders chipped up from holding bricks, from hella bricks and still shooting, from children spackling their parents' backs. Come on, Lord, we all got a history. We can make a home or a cell too, grown thick with ivy or barbed wire. Imagine safety, legacy, and honor. Imagine your future and sunlight, the only thing on your back. Then what will you do with all those bricks? And so I think one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this manuscript and with like anything is to try to like, you know, I kind of, I, like I'm very, I feel all kinds of ways about like poetry and theory and stuff when it comes to like black folks. But I think that it can be really uh, easy as a young artist to get pushed into a place where you're writing stuff that is like black suffering, like done artfully or like, a kind of like unreality of black people that is also done beautifully, you know, and I want to like, with all my work, try to reflect the the full uh, dimension of, of my life, both like, you know, the real struggles and like being locked up, but also like knowing that there's like a way out and trying to find like some kind of way out, you know, um, and so I'm trying to move into that. So uh, ain't no love heart of the city. The city is like history, true, but not honest, never peaceful. It ironed the fight into my veins, creased my palms into a fist, branded me a fire and begged for my caution, said stay, like it didn't know fire either moves or dies. My restlessness is a survival trait I inherited or learned. I wonder which it is for my rage. I just wish we needed warriors, Lord for I would burn the fields for a calm, some surrender, not ours, some funeral, not ours. Wild how I've been taught, cut, bleed, and cauterize, make my body weapon, make my body keloid, dying to be loved, killing for some tenderness mama couldn't promise, cause mama can't promise revolution, can't promise love in the city with its evicting gaze and arresting touch. So we pray and prepare, Curl our hands around backpacks, bill folds, pill bottles, pistol grips, each other's grip, grip everything, weapon or remedy. This was my first lesson. So when my niece pulls my palm to her cheek, giggles and kisses my skin, calloused like history, I wonder what she thinks, weapon or remedy. She asked me to hold her up, spin her like a princess while she hums a song she's just made up. My niece asked me to hold her. Sure, this is what my hands are for. In this small and dizzying revolution in my living room in the city.
Wednesday night interlude. I reach for love as often as the door. I grab the past, tomorrow, or whatever else lives above and behind me, preposition not in my hands. I clench my fingers into the soil at weed roots, remember what power I have and am reminded what I do not. I cannot touch ghosts or God, though I feel their weight the same. They wait the same for twilight to speak. See, my father's throat collapsed before his voice became memory. And now I dream of familiar ghosts, unsure which is him, unsure which smile is mine to claim. I know they aren't me, but they belong to me. Like how one time I saw a body rotted by a Glock, like fruit left in the sun. How the homie said that could have been either of us and how I've been exfoliating my skin and poking at bruises ever since, scrubbing all that blood up to the surface, trying to imagine my body become a painful myth, indistinct, something that could have been but wasn't. There's terror under my glamour, tender muscles beneath my tenderness. I started saying I love you to my homies, holding them longer than we allowed ourselves as boys until our breath makes us big the way it makes us older and more desperate, more worthy of celebration. We are here, come from so many dead. How could we ever be lonely? <laughs> that poem makes me cry, I'm sorry. Uh, mm. And so you get to the last section and the last section is dope, right? Because that's what we're working towards, right? Um, it's like you start out in a trap and you, if you're lucky, you know, you, you can hustle and you get some good words and you might end up dope at the end, right? Um, and it just means you might end up pure, you know, you might end up you, uh, dope, a noun. One, a substance which people use medically, recreationally and strategically classified as an illegal drug by the government. See also good, see also loud, see also love. As in, I got that dope, that shit you need. Two, a substance taken by an athlete or an animal to improve performance. See also juice, see also care. As in, there's no shortage of dope or of people taking dope anywhere. Three, a creation often art so pleasurable that, is, that its quality is undeniable, even addictive. See also crack. See also fire, see also truth, as in dope is like a good dream. It don't sell itself, but it do. Four, a substance with magical and alchemical properties used by black folk to transform realities. See also potion, see also life, see also joy, as in my plug got enough dope to grant wishes, as in dope made my pyrex a cauldron and my palm a wand. Adjective, one refined to purest quality, elite, see also raw, see also uncut, as in, if anything, be dope. Two, undeniable, objective, see also certified, see also trill, as in, if nothing, be dope. And so the last poem, uh, last poem is a love poem to the streets. Last uh, poem is a love poem to the east side of Las Vegas. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just leave it there, man. The streets is watching. Yeah, the streets still watching, still looking out, still checking for you, still stooping right there. And nobody knows how nobody whispers to their hands at night anymore. Shit, it's just the time. It's just not the time. The streets probably tired, probably been swelling up at the corners with ghosts and reasons to keep hustling. The streets probably hungry. Shit, everybody hungry these days, even a landlord, even a tamales lady, even the city. Every stranger wants me to sing to them, tell them they special and they just like me, just hungry like me and my dogs. And yeah, I feed my dogs, but they ribs just like mine. Spent their whole life biting and wishing they were teeth bending themselves to the heart, caving toward what keeps them bleeding. How you know, how you ain't know the streets is just like poetry, just like history, always in the shadows at sunset. Streets be lurking in summer trees. Streets be full of opal and ochre spirits praying you make it home full. Streets really just want you to dance a step. Let them lead you for a turn, lift you in a moment busy with magic like you. Streets know you passing by. 
seeing you coming for a season. Streets love you anyway. Like anything that has thoughtlessly kissed your palms and your shoes and never claimed you, just watched for your return. Thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to share these poems with y'all. Um, it really means a lot, for real, for real. That was fantastic. That yeah. was amazing. Um, I especially love some of the comments that you made about that there's joy um, and, and there is like a, a sensory dance and there was like an omniscience to your work. And I loved, I'm gonna misquote it and I'm gonna ask you to remake sure that you tell me what it is. It's like you even might become you or you might even yeah. be you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're dope, if you're lucky, you might become you, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. what, I think that's what the process, the thing that is so, I mean, so dope about dope to me is that like, it's a thing that we understand, like, I mean, take it to the literal sense, like cocaine, right? Like you take a leaf and you extract from it and you've changed it and you've altered it and you've refined it. But what you get at the end is what you call pure, raw, uncut, right? There's mm -hmm. something about like the essence, right? Of a thing that once you distill it, once a person becomes dope, like we see stuff in the world, we like, yo, that's dope. What that means is like, that's like, unden like that is what that is. That is undeniable greatness. That is like objective excellence, right? Um, and that's something that like, I think when you find that in yourself it's because you found you. You know, like when people, yeah. when we celebrate folks for real, like not on no, like the people we celebrate for petty, stupid reasons, but like when we really find people that are great and we know greatness, it's because we see what we call authenticity. We see yeah. them being themselves, like in a way that all of us want to be, um, you know, individuals who can be part of a community um, because we know who we are. Um, and I think that like part of being dope means that you have to, you have to embrace the process, right? Like I was, I was like, like, I mean, literally there's gasoline, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's like, it's like basically, you know, like sometimes getting to that part, it's like, you know, dumping yourself in gasoline and like going through a process of refinement and then seeing what's left. You know? I just, I love that. And I want to hear more about it. I'm hoping at the end, because I think um, it's been interesting to talk to each artist a little bit about what the process was and how they, it changed them, right? Or how in some way or another, it just became um, something different than you had originally imagined. So, so thank you so much. Beautiful work, thank beautiful you. work. Um, um, now I'd like to introduce our next reader, um, who is someone that, uh, a poet that I have long admired, who I respect, who I just am in awe over the work that they create and just admire a whole bunch, as I've said before, but, um, like to introduce Vanessa Angelica Villarreal. Uh, Vanessa Angelica Villarreal was born in the Rio Grande Valley to Mexican immigrants. She's the author of the 2019 Whiting Award winning collection, Beast Meridian, published by Noemi Press, Acrylica Series 2017. Uh, she's also 2019 Kate Tufts Discovery Award finalist and winner of the John A. Robertson Award for best first book of poetry from the Texas Institute of Letters. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, Paris Review, Boston Review, and Poetry Magazine, where her poem F equals root future was honored with the 2019 Friends of Literature Prize. She's a Canto Mundo and Jack Jones Literary Arts Fellow and is a doctoral candidate in English literature and creative writing at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles, where she is raising her son with the help of a loyal dog. You can find her on Twitter um, at Vanessa ID. Thank you, Vanessa, for being here with us today and just for your presence every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Frank. I, that was incredible. You really just really blew me away. Just the, the heart and the life and the music and the just um, the care in your work was just disarming. Um, I don't think I can go forward. <laughs> I have so much coming from you. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I, I think I'm I think I'm okay. Um, so let me I guess talk a little bit about what this project is before I launch in. So um, you know, Diana knows that I was trying to get into um, detention centers first as like a child advocate. Um, I was trying to like donate, um, you know, just basic toiletries, 
you know, clothes, diapers. Um, and every time I would come to, you know, an entrance or I was told that they would be taking, you know, certain things, um, the institution felt like it was just, there was no opening. There was no, there was no penetrating something I couldn't see beyond it. And like, that's, that's actually what's been so surreal about this whole, everything that's been going on with, with the migrants at, at, at the border is that um, they're always sort of um, an abstraction. We don't have any names. We don't have any faces. It, you know, we have Jacqueline, um, the six-year-old who died. Uh, we have a, a couple of, of names, but we don't have any stories. We don't have any lives. We just have this abstraction of, you know, children in cages. Um, and I think what really overwhelmed me was this sense of survivor's guilt. Um, like, who am I to write about something like this? Um, and what was really frustrating for me was that I didn't want to do this further abstraction. Um, I wanted to write something lived, but because I could never access a single migrant, um, I decided to just dive into the abstraction and I found mm -hmm. stuff there. So this, you know, I guess I just kind of was struck by um, a lot of the work that I was doing that, you know, the things that I could access about these migrants was just documents, the sort of violence of the document. Um, and so um, as I was reading, you know, a bunch of theory and things, um, this, you know, thing, racial calculus really struck me. So I'll start with that quote. If slavery persists as an issue in the political life of Black America, it is not because of an antiquarian obsession with bygone days or the burden of a too long memory, but because Black lives are still imperiled and devalued by racial calculus and a political arithmetic that were entrenched centuries ago. This is the afterlife of slavery, skewed life chances, limited access to health and education, premature death, incarceration and impoverishment. I too am the afterlife of slavery. And then I found this Rudyard Kipling quote. <clears throat> Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile, to serve your captives need, to wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new cot sullen peoples, half devil and half child. The axis of dispossession figure one, dispossession of land. On terra nullius, the state empties the land through the language of law and in doing so invents property. The state imagines itself empty, a peopleless void, a virgin continent awaiting discovery. But the emptying was not quiet, annihilation by violence or virus, the land accounts for every missing breath. The land retaliated, froze and grew barren, formed sheets of ice in mourning. Still its frozen heart is settled, an empirical construct subject to natural law, man's mastery over nature. And so land becomes property. You could make this place beautiful. Another future foreclosed, another plane raised and renamed, another family evicted, another plot sanitized, devastate, disappear, dilute. Law is the narrative power to obliterate all memory under colonial domination. Romance of the vanishing Indian, last of her race. Logic of elimination. Logic of accumulation, dispossession of land. It is violence to even represent. The ship, the father, the mother, the brother, the son, the daughter, the sister, the child ripped from the land, packed like cargo and suspended in water. Destination, not land, but plantation, colony, you stolen, the curved back upon which the new world will be built. In this empire, you build against your will. Blackness is landlessness, is namelessness, is enslavement, is watching whiteness make off with your life. 
ever more capital and ownership and property and calling it individual freedom. What freedom? Once property, all land is plantation, all oceans a graveyard. The axis of dispossession figure two. I had to learn some math to make these. So I, you know, this is an aggregate demand. Um, dispossession of body. On the auction block, the state empties the woman of personhood through the language of law and in doing so invents property. The state imagines ownership who may own these endless fertile fields and ever more bodies to yield its yield, ever more bodies, ever more tender crop, coerce, extract, export, tobacco, cotton, sugar, was the need, was the case, was the perils, was the want, was the particular circumstance, was the seas, was the cost, was the could, was the would, was the policy, was the loss, was the vessel, cargo ship at sea, the first for-profit prison the plantation, another. Law is the narrative power to reduce a mother to chattel, to animal her many labors, to call her daughter's stock and capital to be sold under colonial domination. The art of the deal, a rags to riches, a people its plunder. Dispossession of body. In the new world, the colonial project is to disappear the native from time and space estrange her from memory, land of no one. The continent is emptied by language, remapped by borders rather than relations. Half settler, half native, I face a different emptiness, alone, stranded in time and space. I have no beginning or end in a land evacuated of memory, relation, kin. If not lost to violence, virus, or virgin conquest, we fall to the forgetting self-erase, disappear into whiteness. Tribe obliterated, women violated, children assimilated, we disappear ourselves from ourselves. You know tribe half-blood mestiza. You cannot reclaim your historical bodies. You remember no one. No one remembers you. No tribe claims you because it no longer exists. And as it is in the land, the Indian is vanished in me. The axis of dispossession, figure three. There's nothing left to map but the ocean floor. Nowhere to go when the prison follows you home. I address you, stranger kin. How do we imagine a world without prisons? Shift individual consequences to collective outcomes. Desire our untaming and emerge from half-life restored by a still living vein of original memory in the earth. Le homme, I don't know how to pronounce French, center of reason, the world you make is starving and survival makes criminals of us all. And have you been indicted yet for running the pyramid scheme of self-replicating colonial projects across the face of the globe, where the last deposits of resource can be tapped and traded? There's nowhere left to go, nothing left to extract, no more money to make. We do not have to go forward, because so long as we stay on course and progress on this timeline, or progress on this timeline, history will keep happening to us. Architect one. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the screen share because um, there's not much formally going on there. Um, this poem was um, kind of a trip because I kept like, I don't know, I, I prefer to write in lyric. I prefer to write, um, I don't know, according to musicality, but like, it just felt like Descartes himself was like, no, you have to represent my theory. <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't like talky poems. I don't like discourse in poems. Um, but it just kept like insisting on being there. And so this is an experiment with like a sort of discourse in a poem, but with my critique um, happening inside it. 
In the Middle Ages, the New World, like Southern Africa, was convincingly physically uninhabitable to Europeans. Upon encounters and alongside Descartes' newly mathematizable world and Copernican theory, the question of humanness became wrapped up in the differences between man's embodiment of the image of God and the New World inhabitants. The physical sciences and new struggles over religious frameworks, new heavens, new earths, a moving planet, produced a reasonable man located between the lower natures of brutes and divine natures. Here, human others inside and outside Europe were identifiable enemies of Christ, irrational and abnormal, the creed specific, seemingly universal conception of the human was a natural and rational, godded man. 1641. What will become the prison begins in Europe in the mind of Descartes. Cogito ergo sum. In regarding the new world and its peoples, the European man is thrown into crisis. All he thought he knew of humanness is destabilized at the sight of the black and indigenous body, its physicality. Surely they aren't also human. Surely I am not like them. And so he turns inward to make sense of the world. He rebuilds reality from the anchor of the thought and in thinking himself radically separates mind from body into dual natures, angel and animal, pure soul and bestial body. This is the birth of the white imaginary, the construction of white identity cent central to Western consciousness and its dualism of reason over nature. Reason alone makes us men and distinguishes us from the beasts, the thinking European man as fundamentally different from unthinking nature no longer bound to a collective consciousness, reason places man above nature. And just as mind controls body, so does man control the physical world and the nature bound body of unmapped terrain. A slight metaphysical shift that forms the worldwide structure of oppression and in so doing produces the consciousness that will rupture the world. Forgive me these abstractions. I'm speaking from the end of this timeline. I'm looking for the origin of the world wound, the seismic shift in consciousness that estranged, estranged us from each other and continues to produce this present, the prison, the border. I'm speaking from the burning rainforest, the rising ocean, the atrocities of our dying future. To locate the site of rupture, I must investigate the scene of the crime. Europe, the origin of a consciousness that cannot imagine a world without prison, police, supremacy, the radical separation of mind from body fundamentally remakes reality. Mind over matter is serious business, a dualism that will entrench colonial logic into the sciences just as they are developing and documenting the life and matter of the universe imagined through masculine reason over the animalistic, feminized, nature-bound body. Reason over nature produces the supremacy of the European man in contrast to the irrational colonial subject, the axis of difference upon which the new world is built, mapped, peopled, labored, gendered, fertile coasts, virgin territories, vulnerable, to ships sailing the Cartesian plane across a world, splitting in two. Reason dismantled our collective conscience and shared knowledge systems. When man encounters the unknown, all difference is made irrational to make man coherent, obliterating the colossal mystery of our planet reduced to a dim blue seed. His divine intelligence defined against the irrational animal will go on to invent, invent race, himself the angel above the brute, the monster, the savage, the prisoner, the slave. Diminishing complex eco-spiritual agriculture, advanced astronomical navigation to the limits of his perception. Intricate social systems of kinship lost to skeptical simplistic binaries a reality structured by antagonism, empirical evidence, the burden of proof. Science and law will produce the animal body as suspect, criminal, fugitive, alongside the prison. 
Reason is the domain of empire, its function to set man's gaze on the horizon of expansion that in preserving itself criminalizes the world. Another seismic, seismic shift in reorient, reorienting the world in man, difference becomes permanent. Blackness, the savage, the heathen, the feminine, the base, the queer, the contagion, reason produces the condition of difference as inherent. The other is always not him. For the European man to exist, he must always be defined against difference. Every encounter and estrangement, reminding each of the war. The othered never satisfying the gaze that unmakes the world. From the same mind, cogito ergo sum, as point of origin on a cross, X, Y axes that go on infinitely. This is not a neutral geometry. On the Cartesian plane, empire thinks itself into existence as the center of an infinite expansion. Dual hemispheres of unequal power, mapping reality as property, as capital, as resource, as inheritance for the Euro European man, a crown infinitely possible in any direction. Inextricable, human from European, knowledge, from colony, science, from race. Benefactor of empire, what hubris to shift consciousness from world to self, to shift truth from belonging to the world to the European man alone, himself the judge and all else subject to judgment. Power is the insistence of what one believes to become everyone's truth. And so this reality was mapped onto the Cartesian plane along axes of difference. Man doesn't evolve to reason. Reason imagines difference to create man as superior, tearing reality in two to build an empire of fear, always requiring subjugation to produce the self, borders to produce space, gender to produce labor, a consciousness built on fear that makes a world in which we are ever more not like each other, and in so doing, makes all the world a cell. These are really um, just bright, joyful poems. I'm sorry. <laughs> so this next one, um, is I'm gonna skip this one just because it's a lot more prosy and it's um, sort of tracing. Um, I can share my screen. Um, I basically identify three architects of the prison. Descartes, who defines consciousness. Linnaeus, who um, basically applies the gender binary to nature so that man can fuck it. Um, and Benjamin Franklin. And I wanna move on to Benjamin Franklin because that yanks us into the present. Um, so I will, oh, uh, trigger warning. Um, the images in the Benjamin Franklin poem, um, they're not graphic, but it's, I mean, they were graphic to me. Um, there's a, a, you know, a drawing of a torture device and how it's um, used. And I could not eat that day. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I just, these, these images, this content is like, it's so much. Um, okay. Let me share my screen. Hang on. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so this is the one I'm skipping. Oh, these are just some, um, I, I felt like I was too stuck in the past. So I wanted to kind of show how these things continue to produce the present sort of in the middle as an interlude. Um, Actually, I'm gonna go over here, okay. Architect three, 1776, 
The birth of the United States is inextricable from the birth of the prison with the construction of Walnut Street Jail built to re relieve overcrowding and inhumane conditions at Old Stone Jail. Men, women, and children are confined together in common cells and subjected to public whipping or branding. Illness is rampant. Experimental isolation and labor begin. America, the story you tell begins in the red glare of revolution freedom from empire and taxes, but never with your revolutionary brutality driving innovation. 1787, what will become the prison begins in Philadelphia in the mind of Benjamin Franklin. At the Philadelphia Society for Allevi Alleviating the Miseries of Public Prisons, a group imagines solitary confinement and labor to encourage penitence and reflection. First American, Inventor of the lightning rod and bifocals, you also imagined the modern penitentiary as a Quaker monastery and the unbearable enforced silence of solitary confinement. The trick of enlightenment is how its sciences rationalize atrocities in the colonies, but will be praised for the modern marvel of the architecture. 1829, Eastern State Penitentiary opens and receives its first inmate. Charles Williams, burglar, light black skin, farmer by trade, can read, sentenced to two years segregated confinement labor, confinement with labor. Would he be anything other than black? America's first penitentiary inmate, a black farmer who stole a watch, a coin, and a key. The three things stolen from the enslaved, time, compensation for labor, freedom, the Pennsylvania system, 23 hours a day of complete solitude and silence. Prisoners are not allowed to speak or see any inmates. Prisoners do low wage labor such as shoemaking. Movement out of the cell requires a hood to maintain anonymity and isolation. Listen, the earth is tense with memory, each tree a nerve recording the history that will defeat history. A gem of coal is a demon, a bowl of cotton, a reed of sugar cane, a tumor of gold, blue behind a gun, the grid work that holds bodies. We will begin again with a riot of heat to stay alive. Khalif, I can think only of you. The two years in isolation you survived echoed in the two years of the first prisoner in the United States also in isolation. The excruciating silences around you, the excruciating silence you left behind, the silence of power and everything we could not change. 1836, Eastern State Penitentiary is completed on 11 acres with recreation yards and centrally heated cells with arched ceilings, skylights and plumbing. It becomes the model for prisons around the world and a tourist attraction. 1877, four new cell blocks are built between existing ones, no recreation yards. 1911, cell block 12, three stories, 120 cells is built wedged between the radial wings meant to hold three times as many prisoners. The concrete cells have one small window. By 1926, all outdoor space is replaced with three, three story cell blocks. 1933 to 34, prisoners riot over lack of recreational space, low wages and overcrowding, idleness exacerbates mental illness. 1961, cells are desegregated. Listen, the earth is tense with memory, each tree a nerve recording the history that will defeat history. A gem of coal emerges a diamond, a bowl of cotton, a reed of sugar cane, a tower of gold. Blue, behold blue, the grid of redwood roots. We will begin again, alive. This one's gonna be tough for me. Okay, so, um, I did get to work briefly with a, an immigration lawyer. And unfortunately that was just looking at a lot of cases and documents. Um, 
that's sort of what's really frustrating about this crisis is that it's just a lot of documents. It's a lot of bureaucracy um, and there's just, there are no faces. But um, I was interested in representing at least what the documents look like. This is not a document I handled as part of the, the practice. So those are confidential. This was um, released um, when they couldn't locate you know, the parents. Um, and this is what it looks like, like, you know, just, just a wall of data dehumanized. <clears throat> Parole denial reason. In America, the land is the ghost of the land. In America, the land is the land of the ghost. In America, the land of the ghost in the land. In America, the land is the ghost. In America, the ghost is the land. In America, the land of the, is the ghost land. The land is the land of the ghost. Is the land, is the ghost, is the. The border becomes a site of spatial temporal inequality where first world nations extract time and lifespans from the nation south of the US-Mexico border. The line itself manufactures temporal, temporal social spatial inequality and corrupts the archive, creating slippages of time that manifest as those who remember from those who don't, those who belong to the past and those who belong to the future, dividing languages histories, families, futures. Western temporospatial domination thrives on forgetting and displacement. Migration is an act inextricably bound to childhood. The wolf womb, the open portal, the time wound, the dark pines, shining black back eyes, the shine back, the crying woman, the slap from a man, the slap back, the hole in the wall, the fist in the girl, the half moon split between nations, the obliterated nation, the cord in the bedroom, the milky flame, the leaf of cloth around the child, the found secret, the way down. The migrant child is the figure that motivates the abject cruelty of white supremacist violence. Children represent the future and migrant children are the embodiment of what drives white racial anxiety. A future in which whites are outnumbered and replaced by non-white migrants and their children. The child in the image is no longer a human being, but a debate, a symbol flattened by rhetoric, her grief and terror on loop, dimming before our very eyes. This will be my last one. I flee to the edge of this country in the two stag dark, stand on an escarpment undoing itself in ash. Not yet a boy, I still, I eat still the figs that bloat with inverted blossoms when halved sometimes a blonde wasp and called in its violet lobe. This, of course, is the dream body eating its omen. California moons, a coast breathing oranges, a fire fast as horses, duplicitous husband, a steel great border extending its long law into the ocean, a wave halved. Never trust beauty to represent brutality. I can give you no language that will free the child from her cage, make no meaning that unfloods the world, no verse that can unfire a bullet. I eat the spine of God to stay alive. Eldest daughter to an eldest daughter of an eldest daughter, I citizen three child mothers at the river's door. Obedient bruise root, rebel virgin, doomed bride. Translate passage. The girl abandoned in a sinking marshland will never be named in America. America is just another boy with bad intentions, another flooding plot of discovery drowning its ever lousier yellows. How many daughters have been paid to the ship? Dissolution, 
to witness my own water burial. At the cut bank, knife the rope and split the dress, maiden myself taut as an elm bow drawn, thighs seized red, holding a dormant knot. In every father's cruelty to his daughter is a husband recognizing the danger of himself. Every man a heat trapped rancor, every promise a demon's gem. Mirror born, the wolf girl will learn two names in the twin land, tense with blood memory. Checkpoint, border patrol asks, place of birth. I speak, exit the vehicle, legs open. The moon enthroned in oaks shines through the wood lace over the state. A father in the grasses, a headlight cleaves mother and boy, another child at the edge of this country, another body denied a metaphor. What regret can be doddered deeper? Yeah, I'm still grappling with it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think um, some of the things um, that we don't forget, but I think it's also, it's always very powerful to realize this has been going on for so long, for, for so long, right? Um, coinciding with sort of structures of power and how those have begun and sort of, because those in power decided, you know, just based on the images that you shared, like these torture devices. Mm -hmm. um, Linnea? Uh, Crazy. So much. If, you, if you go back and look at just like the invention of race, like how, you know, the man is sort of depicted in, in the archive, it's, it's, it's really wild, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah. I don't know, engaging with this um, has allowed me to sort of look at time in a, in like a pulled back kind of way and imagine it, another future, a different future. And, um, I shared some of my work um, with a couple of poets, um, Raquel being one of them, because uh, I was just, I was really grappling with the ethics. I was just like, can I even speak about this? Like, is, what am I doing? And I said, I forgot that when I learned that I had a half sister, she was in juvenile detention and I sent her leaves of grass, which is like, <laughs> I shouldn't have sent her that. And then I started remembering like, all of my like cousins and uncles who have like been sort of, who've had brushes with the law. And I'm like, why didn't they come up first? Mm -hmm. And it was a protective instinct, right? It, it's not that I'm embarrassed, it's that that's not mine to tell. My, my strength is critique. I can speak to the institution, so. You did, a, you did an amazing job, like really blown away and just thankful that you were able to be part of this to contribute. Like we're, we're just lucky. I mean, to have you three here. So thank you. Um, all right. So I'd like to now introduce our final reader, um, who is also another poet that I follow very closely, and I'm in awe of all of the work that they do. Raquel Salas Rivera, Mayagas, 1985, is a Puerto Rican poet, translator, and editor. His honors include being named the 2018-2019 Poet Laureate of Philadelphia and receiving the New Voices Award from Puerto Rico's Festival de la Palabra. He is the author of five full-length poetry books. His third book, Lo Tercerio, The Tertiary, won the Lambda Literary Award for Transgender Poetry and was long listed for the 2018 National Book Award. His fourth book, While They Sleep Under the Bed is Another Country, was long listed for the 2020 Penn American Open Book Award and was a finalist for CLMP's 2020 Firecracker Award. His fifth book, XXXS, won the inaugural Ambrosio Prize, Antes Que Isla Es Volcán, Before Island Is Volcano, his sixth book, is an imaginative leap into Puerto Rico's decolonial future and is forthcoming from Beacon Press in 2022. He holds a PhD in comparative literature and literary theory at the University of Pennsylvania. This year, he joined the board of directors of a new community project for trans and queer youth, Camp Albizu. He is also alongside Raquel Abarron and Val Arboneas, editing the first anthology of Puerto Rican trans poetry 
la piel de arrecife, is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Um, published by La Impresoria in 2020. Accompanied by his cat, Titri, he currently writes and teaches in Puerto Rico. Gracias, Raquel, for being here with us today. Gracias a ti. I also want to thank Frank, um, whose poems blew me away, and Vanessa. I'm still sort of reeling from that reading. And I also wanted to mention, um, Diana, that your book also uh, was one of the best books I read last year. I, I found it incredible, and I, I wish more people had um, mentioned it because uh, I'm and kind of always uh, grateful for that. that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, let's let's start with uh, with what what um, yeah. Why don't we play a song? Um, why don't we play a song? So we're gonna go ahead. I'm gonna start on my computer. A really beautiful um, piece that Raquel sent. Um, I she they will introduce it, and I'm gonna go ahead and work on getting it playing so we could hear this beautiful melody. <laughs> El ganador se ve inquieto, el cielo es duro concreto, el aire está suspendido, no se escucha ni un silencio, todo anuncia el tormento, toda esa ansiedad. El cielo es duro concreto, ya se espera el gran timbrazo, llega el temporal, tiempo ya, tiempo da. Ya te viene el temporal, tiempo viene, tiempo va, allá viene el temporal, tiempo tienes, tiempo das, va y viene el temporal. ¿Qué será de mi Borinquen cuando esté a capacidad? ¿Qué será de Puerto Rico cuando no nos quede más? Tiempo ya, tiempo da, ya te viene el temporal. Tiempo viene, tiempo va, allá viene el temporal. Tiempo viene, tiempo va, allá viene el temporal. Todo el pueblo está reunido en la cárcel más cerrada. Algunos están rezando, Dios mío, todo esto está en la mala. Tiempo ya, tiempo da, ya te viene el temporal. Tiempo viene, tiempo va, allá viene el temporal. Tiempo tienes, tiempo das, va y viene el temporal. ¿Qué será de mi Borinque cuando esté a capacidad? ¿Qué será de Puerto Rico cuando no nos quede más? Los hombres están condenados. Las puertas y las ventanas, hay aroma encerrado, la esperanza para mañana. Los viejos van comentando de temporales pasados, los jóvenes escuchando, hoy los suyos comenzaron. Santa María, líbranos de todo mal, amparanos, señora del terrible temporal. Santa María, líbranos de todo mal, amparanos, señora, de ese terrible animal. Santa María, líbranos de todo mal, amparanos, señora, de ese terrible animal. Thank you, Raquel, for, for bringing that to the table. It was something that I think was really profound, and I'd love to hear a few words about that song and what it means and why you thought to bring it and share, you know, share it with us today. Thank you so much for, for playing that. Um, it's actually a, a very popular plena, which is a type of music in Puerto Rico that along with bomba um, was a music uh, created, invented, and um, kept alive by enslaved people, but then became um, a sort of, sort of more generalized popular form of music. And for a long time, even, even as it grew in popularity, uh, was still very rejected by the wealthy and the bourgeoisie in Puerto Rico as a music that you would play like in cafetines or, you know, bars or, you know, it was low, it was lowly music. And now it's, um, you know, much like other popular forms of music created by enslaved peoples. Now it's it, legit and considered legit and whatnot. And everyone plays it at Christmas and everyone knows it. So this is a very popular plena um, called Temporal. 
And part of what I did for this project in, in one particular section was to reimagine these plenas, um, but in reference to uh, the carceral system and in particular to the Oso Blanco penitentiary, which is uh, what I decided to focus my writing on. And so this is my rewriting of Temporal, um, written right um, from within El Oso Blanco is, is, is from that perspective. And uh, I guess as an introduction to what I'm going to be reading, uh, I wanted to say that this is um, historically situated um, as a sort of journey uh, through the early years of the creation of El Oso Blanco. El Oso Blanco Penitentiary, or White Bear, I'm gonna share the screen here a moment. Um, uh, Right, I've translated it in, in a variety of different ways, um, in part because the name comes from a type of, the type of concrete that was used to build um, the penitentiary. And this concrete uh, was from Venezuela and the company was called Oso Blanco. Um, and it marked a very important moment in the modernization project of the early 20th century in Puerto Rico. And so the prison um, was seen as a model for um, how Puerto Rico was being modernized. And, um, and of course, as I went, delved deeper and deeper into the investigation, of, of course, all of these very intense sort of facts and coincidences and not that aren't really coincidences, right? Like came up uh, among them that the prisoners, um, the prisoners built the prison and um, that as part of the original plan and the original build of the prison, it had an interior courtyard and a garden and was sort of, the, the plans were laid out and structured the way that like a Spanish plaza, a Spanish city. Um, and so, you know, here all, all la get layered all of these layers of colonialism and the history of slavery and colonialism in Puerto Rico, right, from Spain to the US. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'm, instead of explaining all of it, I'm just going to like delve in. One other thing to keep in mind is that there's a character, right, that is um, the sort of central figure that moves through this text. And that uh, character is Senex, which is a character that's appeared in other um, of my work. Senex comes from uh, Seneos. Um, it's a, actually one of the few trans figures in Ovid's Metamorphosis. Um, who was granted a transition um, after being raped um, by Poseidon. So Poseidon said, I, I grant you a wish in exchange for this. And the thing that um, Seneos wished for was to be turned into a man. And I changed this a little bit into a sort of non-binary figure um, that is incarcerated in a, man's, in a male prison, right? In a man's prison, um, which was El Oso Blanco. And, one more thing before we go on. Um, part of the reason why it shows El Oso Blanco, um, it's been shut down for a long time. There have been these efforts to sort of restructure it because it was built by, uh, or to rescue it as, as a historical site because it was built by a very important architect. And all of this was very striking to me, right? This sort of um, fixation with the architecture, uh, uh, you know, rather than, <laughs> right, the fact that it was a prison, right, this sort of like, it's a historical, right, space um, argument. And it, the arc of its construction and also its decay very much follows the arc of the establishment of Puerto Rico as Estado Libre Asociado, the English Commonwealth, but really the translation would be Free Associated State, which is uh, part of the modernization projects um, in that arc created by Luis Munoz Marin and its inevitable collapse. And so what we're living in is right now um, sort of like late capitalist um, post collapse of the Estado Libre Asociado space in which there are all these old buildings that had been built um, as part of modernization that are in decay, um, but also that right carry those ghosts um, much like Puerto Rico right now, right? Where we have these layerings of ghosts and ghosts and ghosts. And it also happens to be very, very close to, um, to where my father lived. Um, he passed away this last November. And so I, it's very close to heart as a project because as I was writing this, right, um, I had been collaborating with him um, because he had worked actually for uh, the carceral system as a lawyer. 
And so, you know, he, it has been a very complex sort of relationship to that and um, sort of talking through what that had been. And he was very familiar with El Solanco. And so his passing away um, felt like it was very tied into this, this project. Okay, enough talking, <laughs> enough introduction. Um, and let's start with this uh, quote, this epigraph. Casi frente por frente al manicomio, en la jurisdicción de Río Piedras, circundado por un panorama donde la naturaleza diríase que canta una terna romanza de primavera, y erguese cual gigantesca mole cuadrangular, el nuevo centro de reclusión. A la entrada, una ancha puerta enreda de hierro, con dos figuras de mujer talladas en alto relieve a ambos lados, una simbolizando la justicia, la otra la ley. En pleno frontispicio, esta frase, odia el delito y compadece al delincuente. En el vestíbulo, ya nota el visitante la fina sencillez que caracteriza toda la estructura, pero la impresión que no se espera la recibe uno cuando al cruzar el primer pasillo, el patio le sale al encuentro amplio y hermoso patio borracho de luz que más bien parece un gran parque de recreo donde hay césped y arbustos formando jardines una espaciosa acera de mosaico al centro y dos grandes postes de faroles eléctricos. There's only one mistranslation which I caught later but it's fine. Almost face to face with the asylum in the Rio Piedras jurisdiction, surrounded by a panorama where one could say nature sings an eternal romance to spring, stands on its hind legs like a giant quadrangular beast, the new detention center. At the entrance, a wide door tangled with iron is guarded by the figures of two women carved into the high relief on both sides, one symbolizing justice, the other the law. In full frontispiece is the phrase, hate the crime and pity the criminal. In the vestibule, visitors can already note the fine simplicity that characterizes the entire structure. But the impression one would not expect comes upon crossing the first hallway and encountering the courtyard, ample and gorgeous patio drunk off light that seems more a great public park where grass and bushes form gardens, a spacious sidewalk filled with a mosaic stands in the center, along with two giant electrical lampposts. El Mundo, 14 de mayo, 1933, May 14, 1933. Entonces vio su futuro. Senex se rodeaba en el medio del camino, minuto tras minuto, un caballo se acercaba estadísticamente. Aferrado a un objeto robado y reciente ya, sin saber correr ni por qué, miraba sus manos y soltaba su empuñadura, perdiendo el respeto por una edad maleable que soltaba en peñones y todavía no era suficientemente peligrosa para amar. Lo que hacía falta era un arresto, un estado que en una tierra oscura y joven no cometía errores. Nadie lloraba lo suficiente ni remotamente. Entonces lo soltó al suelo, entonces atrapó el fuego, un farol dándole su paliza de puñojo, las palmas sudando, pelaza y los dedos se enroscaban, leña menuda que apretaba el aire tan visible. Then they saw their future. So next kneeled in the middle of the path, minute by minute, a horse statistically approached. Stuck on a stolen and recent object, no longer knowing to run nor why, looking at hands and losing the handle, losing respect for a malleable age that released in boulders and already was insufficiently dangerous for love. What was left was an arrest, a state that on dark and fresh soil made no mistakes. No one cried enough or remotely, then let it hit the ground, then trapped fire a lantern, giving a fist beating, Palms sweat molasses and fingers curled, kindling around this one's air. I'm going to stay with the screen sharing because for a few of these because they are very um, visual. Los prisioneros del 1930 sembraron flores en la prisión del 1933. Cruz de Malta, 112 cuerdas de terreno. Lluvia de corales, 250 presos sembrando, 
reina de las flores en la finca de la penitenciaria, canarios violeta con grama y adornos, astromelias en el patio interior y en la finca, langostas rojas, cercada por púa de 12.674 metros, ave de paraíso, los escombros del trabajo en fosas, manto español, 66 cuerdas para el cultivo de alimentos trinitarias y rosas. In 1930, the prisoners planted flowers in the prison of 1933. Cruz de Malta, 112 acres of land, Coral Fountain, 250 prisoners planting, queen of flowers, orchid, on the penitentiary farm, violet canary creepers with grass and decorative astromeria, in the interior yard and on the farm, bright red hands closed in by barbs reaching 12,672 meters, birds of paradise, debris of work in common graves, Spanish mantle, 66 acres to grow foods, bougainvilleas and roses. Del campo a la ciudad. The erection of a new penitentiary on lands of the people of Puerto Rico a short distance from San Juan, with farms and a number of different shops well fitted up with the necessary machinery, is a badly felt necessity. 234 Puerto Rican Island Penitentiary, 38,927 Rio Piedras State Penitentiary, 345 Penitenciaria en Rio Piedras, 9,993 Presidio Insular, 945 penitenciaria total, 48, 485,379 presidio, 00 penitenciaria modelo, 845 oso blanco. Criminalidad, penología o derechos civiles versus un libro de pico. La alfabetización del campo manual de obras cuadradas por el arquitecto penoso Francisco Roldán, en el campo la fuga pocamente encaminada al monte presidiario, del descanso al borio, el sol a los pasos consintiendo su ocio sin hacinamiento, reclina la nariz contra una corteza navaja y antesala. Este mes podaron el árbol bajo el tren y cambiaron el cuartel. Ya no se lee la letra lejanía, cambiaron la carta, ya no lee su letra lejanía, cambiaron el cartel, ya no votes por el partido opositor con su letra lejanía. La maquinaria nueva se mueve según su especialización climática, el cambio sobre un cuerpo se mide por su resistencia, ya no se confina bajo el sol, sino conteniendo las sombras en gradientes de gris, en la sombra se desangra cemento venezolano, Puedes resistir lo más moderno de su género indistintamente. With few footnotes that are doing different things here. No, Penal um, obviously has a series of uh, resonances, right? It means relates both to the penal system, but also to Penoso. Penoso can be both the penal system and also um, that causes sadness. Penoso, penal, pena, penuria, plantel, subasta, sistémico, albumen, sustrato de cal, cemento. From town to city. The erection of the new penitentiary on the land of the people of Puerto Rico, a short distance from San Juan, with farms and a number of different shops well fitted up with the necessary machinery is a badly felt necessity. 234 Puerto Rico Island Penitentiary, 38,927 Rio Piedras State Penitentiary, 345 Penitenciaria en Rio Piedras, 9,993 Presidio Insular, 945 Penitenciaria Estatal, 485,379 Presidio, 00 Penitenciaria Modelo, 845 Costo Blanco. Criminality, Penology, or Civil Rights versus One Book by Pico. Literacy efforts for the manual labor of work squ squared off by the laborious architect Francisco Roldan in the country 
Fugue, few times heading to convicted fields of arboreal rest, sun exceeding steps, their idleness sends overcrowding, reclining nose against a blade and anteroom bark. This month, they move the tree under the train and change the station. One can no longer read furtherness far. They change the letter. You no longer read its furtherness further. They change the sign. You no longer vote for the opposing party with its far offness further put. New machinery moves according to its climatic specialization. The change to a body is measured by resistance, no longer confined under the sun, but rather containing shadows and gradients of gray. In the shade, Venezuelan cement bleeds out. You can resist the most modern of its kind indistinguishably. Of course, my translation of the footnotes in English are a little different. Laborious, lugubrious, la cuna, la penal, the penal, the penalty, the carceral, the prison. And um, this particular poem is probably the last. Uh, one of the last screen shares I'll do. <laughs> this particular poem uh, was a challenge to translate um, because it, it plays on a song by Ismael Rivera, Maelo Rivera, I don't know if you know it, but um, it's called Las Tumbas, um, which means the tombs, but is also the name of a very famous prison um, in the United States where a lot of Puerto Ricans were sent. Um, and the song is simultaneously about being imprisoned, but also about like many, many of Milo's songs about his struggle with heroin. heroin. Um, and it's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. And, and right, this was a common theme in salsa, um, songs of the time. Um, uh, right, for example, there's one song that actually has a refrain in English that's, I'll never go back to Georgia. And it's because, um, Puerto Ricans were sent to a prison in Georgia. Um, and this particular epigraph, las tumbas son para los muertos, y de muerto no tengo nada, um, would translate roughly as um, the tombs are for the dead and with the dead I share nothing. And this was sort of the structure of El Oso Blanco, right? Um, so this was a uh, how it was designed to have an interior patio and then to have the person around that interior patio. And this became more and more intense as I um, kind of moved forward in my sort of like investigatory work, uh, which was very difficult because there are actually so few books written on the carceral system in Puerto Rico, it's shocking. Um, but uh, part of what made this very intense was that these there were even like pigs in the original design and all kinds of livestock. And later as um, conditions of the prison got worse, uh, prisoners depended actually on the things they were growing in this interior garden um, to eat. So this is sort of um, a play of course on Blanco, which is in Blanco is, has many meanings, but blanco means white, but it also means, um, can mean blank, like blank space. Okay, how are we doing? Hey. It's slightly overwhelming, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I think we're gonna no. stop the screen here. Um, and go to just reading. En las primeras décadas del nuevo siglo. Senex se puso en marcha, pero en ese siglo Betún había cometido un delito digno de castigo, un robo de arroz y café o una deuda de grano, ron y tierra. La justicia, siempre excelsa, le encontró a pie en el camino real, sediente de fuente. Y aunque en el artículo 1 quedaba prohibida la extracción de esclavos sin permiso real, en el artículo 2.1 exceptuaba los sentenciados por los tribunales. La transportaron, le transportaron ante aquel cajón de, sa, de la zafra, con su estalactita pendiente, donde las guardias revisaban los reclusos 
Una detallaba los procedimientos y la otra los desvestía. La española con voz tallada explicaba mientras la gringa supervisaba la fila. Una repetía con tono compareciente y la otra los miraba con odio fijo y manoseo firme. La estructura en sí se debatía. El estilo neomudéjar, con su afán secular, contenía un corazón vacío de reforma, una gran plaza de ciudad española sembrada de flores fugitivas. And um, some of the verses here are actually extractions from codes um, that were established um, both during and after the abolition of slavery um, in Puerto Rico, uh, pertaining to uh, who could get arrested and la, le la, la libreta o jornal. So even after slavery was abolished, um, Puerto Ricans were forced to carry a notebook around um, specifying those who, right, um, the ex-enslaved were forced to carry a notebook around saying who they worked for. Otherwise they would get arrested, right? And so a lot of these um, are a combination of things written about the prison and things written uh, and these codes, these legal codes that established um, who was allowed to um, work and be free and who wasn't. Mm -hmm. So next began their march, but in this bitumen century, they had committed a felony worth punishment, a theft of rice or coffee or a debt of grain, rum or land. Justice, always lofty, found Senex on the royal road, thirsty for a source. And although Article 1 states that the extraction of slaves is prohibited without royal decree, Article 2.1 makes an exemption for those sentenced by tribunals. They were transported before that crate of harvest with its dangling stalactite, where the guards checked inmates, one detailed the procedures and the other handling and dressing. The Spaniard with a carved voice explained while the gringa supervised the line. One repeated a tone appearing before the other with a fixed hate and a firm hand. The structure itself debated. The neo mudejar style, its secular toil, contained a heart free of reform. A great plaza for a Spanish city planted with fugitive flowers. And I'm going to skip these because they're the rewritings of the plenas. Reciclaje. En el oso blanco se construyó la primera industria local de confección de juguetes con materiales reciclados. Algunos días lo más sencillo parece un magno festival. Un juguete muerto, por ejemplo, tiene tanto potencial. En los días malos hay mucho mosquito, poca luz. La corriente corre tuberculosa hacia el pasillo. En los días buenos se duerme sin mosquitero, en los días malos se duerme sin mosquitero. El día, por ejemplo, tiene mucho potencial de noche. La noche, por ejemplo, tiene mucho potencial. No por esto son iguales, sino reciclables. Pueden, si los renuevas con las manos y con el tiempo, hacerse algo nuevo sin cambiarse de esencia. Ni las manos ni el tiempo son materia reciclable. Ya la antelequia sería con su paso. Por eso es que tendrán que ser el motor testigo de los juguetes nuevos. Construirán nuevas formas de materiales viejos, construirán nuevos juegos, desmantelando viejas formas con las manos en el tiempo, con el tiempo en las manos. Un magno festival. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the uh, quote I use here, un magno festival, is actually a description in the newspaper of when the prison was inaugurated. It's a magnificent festival called Recycling. In the Oso Blanco was built the first local industry dedicated to making toys out of recycled materials. Some days the simplest thing seems a magnificent festival. A dead toy, for example, has so much potential. On bad days, there is much mosquito, little light. The current runs tuberculously toward the hall. On good days, one sleeps without a net. On bad days, one sleeps without a net. The day, for example, has a lot of night potential. The night, for example, has a lot of potential. This doesn't make them equal, just recyclable. They can, if renewed with hands and with time, make something new without losing their essence. Neither hands nor time are recyclable. 
Already Enteleki leaves with its passage. This is why they must be the motor witness of new toys. They shall build new forms from old matter. They shall build new toys dismantling old forms with hands in time, with time in their hands. The Magnificent Festival. Okay, I don't wanna go over time. Um, how are we uh, on time? A little over already? <laughs> no, I think, you know, if you wanted to read, you know, a little bit more, you could. Um, I think okay, if- I'm gonna read a little bit more and then yo creo que no es todo I'm gonna read two more. La promiscuidad tan indeseable. En 1934, la emigración del campo llevó a la formación de la corte nocturna para procesar de noche y de día. Los niños se enviaban a Mayagüez, las niñas a Ponce, las mujeres a Arecibo. Algunas pasaban por el Oso Blanco. Paula, empleada doméstica natural de Vieques. En 1939, el primer caso de corrupción que llega a lo que se llega. Irregularidades en el manejo y desembolso de fondos irregularidades en la investigación del propio gobierno, ese mismo año la cárcel se supera, la más moderna de su época. Pocos salen con oficio, pocos salen con sentencias más largas y el rigor. Y para el 1940 dejaron el afán reformista, pasan a donde sea posible, donde esté disponible, si se puede autosostener. El procurador general da informes al grano. Senex cumple su sexto año y se sabe que hay una guerra mundial, como se sabe de todo, fuera de la norma, porque paran los rumores de expansión de una nueva ala. Entraba menos gente durante la guerra, también nada mejoraba, pero comenzaron a llegar más después que se ganó o perdió lo que se iba, directo a la boca del oso. Los delitos más graves, las sentencias más largas y después la guerra, y durante la guerra menos comida, menos ropa. Aún así dicen que por ser más grande era mejor. Ya ven que tienen Biblias y misa en el patio interior. La más moderna de la modernidad. El procurador general Enrique Campos del Toro, militar, humanista, autocrítico, sus palabras tan hondas como cualquier calabozo. El preso no se le reconoce calor humano alguno. Para recapitular. En nuestras cárceles, en nuestra cárcel se asinan de todos tipos los delincuentes todos viviendo en la promiscuidad tan indeseable. Cuando usa la palabra ocio, se refiere al tiempo. Según el general, existe un exceso temporal, un exceso táctil. Su solución es simple, aumentar los talleres, triplicar la producción. Las reformas alivian la promiscuidad, acompañadas por nuevas ilegalidades. Ahora, Jugar bolita y polipool, ahora la paga por ciertos servicios no regulados, como ser de Loíza, nacido, criado y arrestado. Pasan las décadas, todos aumentan, todo me disminuye. Una tal Helen Hooker denuncia la falta que le hacen en un mundo de faltas y fallos, pero dice algo común e increíble, que Senex no deja de repetirse de noche. Tremendo esfuerzo por tapar el cielo con la mano. El cielo con la mano no es imposible. Cada día las manos construyen cielos. El cielo es cosa de planificación. Pero si atrapas unas manos, aprendes a pescar nubes. Such undesirable promiscuity. 1934, migration from the fields led to the formation of the nocturnal court to process night and day. Boys were sent to Mayagüez, girls to Ponce, women to Arecibo. Some pass through El Oso Blanco, Paula, domestic worker, originally from Vieques. In 1939, the first case of corruption that leads to what it does, irregularities in the management and disbursement of funds, irregularities in the government's self-investigation. That same year, the prison self exceeds. The most modern of its era, few leave with new trades, few leave with sentences longer and more rigor. By 1940, they quit all reformist drive, moving on to wherever possible, wherever available, if it can self-sustain. The attorney general gives no-nonsense reports. Senex spends his sixth year and knows there is a world war like he knows about all things outside the norm. 
because expansion rumors have stopped. No new wing. Less people came in during the war. Also, nothing improved, but later came more. After it was won or lost, whatever went directly to the bear's mouth, the felonies more serious, the servings longer, and after the war, and during the war, less food, less clothes. Even so, they say it because it is bigger, it is better. You can see there are Bibles and mass in the inner patio, the most modern of all modernity. The Attorney General Enrique Campos del Toro, military officer, self-critical humanist, his words as deep as any dungeon. The inmate does not recognize any human heat. To recap recapitulate, in our prisons, in our prison, all sorts overcrowd, delinquents, all living in such undesirable promiscuity. When he uses the word idleness, he means time. According to the Attorney General, there is a temporal excess, a tactile excess. His solution is simple, increase the workshops, triplicate production. Reforms alleviated promiscuity, accompanied by new illegalities. Now to play pool, now to pay for certain unregulated services like being from Loisa, born, raised, and arrested. The decades pass, everyone increases, everything diminishes, until one Helen Hooker denounces lack in a world full of lacks and failures, but says something incredible and common that Senex keeps mumbling at night. A great effort to cover the sky with one hand. See, the sky with one hand is not impossible. Every day, hands build skies. The sky just takes planning. But if you trap some hands, you can learn to catch clouds. And I think I'm gonna end with this sort of reimagining of Fanon, Franz Fanon, and Senex as um, prisoners in Los Blanco. Senex propone un programa de desorden absoluto. Dentro de un saco de mordiscos, los dientes tiritan, cascabeles amenazantes. La descolonización es un programa de desorden absoluto. Los pies en el agua revelan su condición de piedra. Las langostas de río nadan y caminan. Todavía existen las cárceles, ahora mismo las cárceles. La mano que muerde entrega, las sortijas cortan y confunden su metal con su sangre. Se cree casado, se casa, depredador de sí. Todavía existen los carceleros, 22 años y cuando salió los celulares, los carteles, aquel edificio no derrumbado, pero sí ruina, el otro ahora es un colmado cerrado. En la barra del desorden absoluto espera Fanon. Todos los tragos están a 50 centavos, de los que se tiran en una fuente, solo se intercambian amuletos cuando compro un trago es como si entregara 50 besos o 50 mordiscos. Todos lo llaman así por respeto, Franz, no Fanon, no Franz. Se sienta en una esquina a velar su negocio. Su risa es otra expresidaria. El bartender Senex asaltó una, una, a un, un, el bartender Senex asaltó a una gasolinera Puma. Se lo conocieron en el oso blanco y se leyeron fragmentos de los condenados de la tierra, especialmente la parte que dice la descolonización es siempre un fenómeno violento. Fanon salió un héroe y Senex no conseguía entre, entrevista de trabajo. Pero cuando se dio la gran guerra de las reinitas bravas y sacudieron la disciplina entre árbol y medusa, Fanon se adueñó de todo menos la propiedad privada. Todos los recursos salieron a celebrar en la barra más popular de estos cinco siglos y quien los atendió alguna vez hizo de todo por dinero. Of course, this hinges on a, two quotes by Fanon, one of which is, decolonization is a program of absolute disorder. So next proposes a program of absolute disorder. In a sack full of bites, teeth chatter, threatening rattles. Decolonization is a program of absolute disorder. Feet in the water reveal their stone condition. River shrimp swim and walk. There are still prisons right now, now prisons. The hand that bites feeds. Rings cut and confuse their metal with your blood. You think you are wed, you hunt preying on yourself. There are still jailers, 22 years, and when he got out, the cell phones, the signs, that building, not torn down, but yes, ruin, the other one, a closed bodega. At the bar of absolute disorder, Fanon expects us. All the shots are 50 cents, the kind you throw in a fountain. 
Only amulets are exchanged. When you buy a drink, it's as if you gave 50 kisses or 50 bites. The bartender held up, held up a puma station. They met in El Blanco and read each other fragments of the wretched of the earth, especially the part that says, decolonization is always a violent phenomenon. Fanon got out a hero and Senex couldn't get a job interview. But with the great war of wild reinitas, when they shook the discipline between Tree and Medusa, Fanon took over everything except private property. All the inmates went out to celebrate at the most popular bar of these five centuries and were served drinks by a man that once did most things for money. Mm. ¿Y qué es el dinero para el pobre sino el hambre? ¿Y qué es el hambre sino una deuda con el cuerpo? Todo se atrasa con poca alternativa. La sangre se tapona de camino a la piel. También quiere salirse de aquí ahora. Confiesa tu crimen a cambio de años. Es un contrato común. Se ensucia así. Los que protestan aclaran que no son criminales. La ley es un crimen, dicen, contra el pueblo. En la cárcel no se permiten pueblos. Un pueblo en la cárcel se llama motín. ¿Cómo se vive en una cárcel? En un barco atracado a 10 olas del mar abierto. What is money to the poor if not hunger? What is hunger if not a debt we owe our body? Everything is back ordered with little choice. Blood gets jammed on its way to the skin. It also wants to get out now. Confess your crime in exchange for years. It's a common contract. It gets dirty like that. Those who protest let us know they aren't criminals. The law is a crime, they say, against the people. In prison, peoples aren't permitted. A people in a prison is called a riot. In prison, how does one live on a ship docked in the harbor, 10 waves away from the open sea? Senex le escribe un poema a Fanon, sin cárceles, sin policías, sin gringos. La decolonización es un programa de desorden absoluto, donde las drogas no ascienden de clase legalizada, donde son siempre el crimen de quien no tiene seguro, ni licencia, ni ciudadanía. Nada seguro, todo seguro. Nada asegurado, todo seguro. ¿Cuándo le devolverán la vida a todos los que fueron arrestados por vender pasto? Donde artes plásticas capeaban en la perla que muchos hablan de nostalgia, de tiro y de olas de violencia. América, deja de injectarnos tu discurso de vaquero. Un 20 en la redada de repente se triplica. Los guardias siembran armas en las trincheras. Fanón, ayúdame a derrocar el monopolio del Nuevo Día y el Banco Popular. ¿Cómo que descolonización penal? La modernización colgó un collar de loterías caducas sobre la ventana panóptica de la caseta de guardia. Escribo un poema sin control de acceso, sin ganas de castigo, sin comparaciones entre estados y activistas, sin celebraciones de arrestos federales, sin gran jurado, sin fianzas prohibitivas, sin fianzas, sin celdas, sin macanas, sin rectitud de estatua. So next wrote Fanon a poem. Without prisons, without cops, without gringos, decolonization is a program of absolute disorder where drugs don't climb the social ladder legalized, where they are always the crime of those without insurance, license, or citizenship. Nothing sure, everything secure, nothing insured, everything secured. When will they give life back to all those arrested for selling weed? The students went down to cop in La Perla. Oh, how they speak nostalgically of shots and violent waves. America, stop grafting your cowboy discourse. A 20 in the raid suddenly triplicates. The cops plant guns in gutter trenches. Fanon, help me topple the monopolies run by El Nuevo Día and Banco Popular. What do you mean penal decoloniality? Modernization hangs a string of expired lottery tickets over the security guard's panoptic view. I wrote you a poem without access control, without a desire to punish, without comparing activist states, without celebrating federal arrests, without grand jury, without prohibitive bail, without bail, without cells, without night sticks, without the straightness of statues. Gracias. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you all. It's all good. Oh my God. <laughs> These amazing Senex. I mean, that character that I just, I want the whole book now. <laughs> I, I want to I read what happened, you know? Um, beautiful, beautiful rendering um, of, of many different um, difficult topics um, but for, from all of you. Um, so I just want to say thank you for sitting down with me. So thank you again, everyone, for amazing um, 
just amazing presentations of your work um, and just talking about, you know, the, the issue of mass incarceration, um, which just affects millions of people around the world, um, specifically the, the United States. Um, one of the things that the Art for Justice grant, um, which we want to also thank the Ford Foundation for um, um, grant, granting us this opportunity to create spaces for poets to create new commissioned work, is that you were able to get a little bit of funding for research and books. Um, and I don't know if any of you want to share, uh, you know, um, a, about a book that you read that was really central to sort of the development of the project. Um, if, if that, you know, is something that you want to share or talk about. Yeah, I, I can grab one. Actually, I'm just going to grab it. Off my yeah. I have um, this really cool book called um, Troublemakers um, that I got. It's a like basically ba it's all it's a sort of like visual like it's a kind of like an art book um mm -hmm. that like documents like the history of like chicago like freedom struggles and um through like a particular lens of these people who were like arrested um and sort of released and then tried to like a sort of like move in a like a civil rights move, like generate a civil rights movement um through like colleges and stuff in the 50s and 60s and um I don't know. So the reason why this, like, I don't know, so much of this thinking uh, is really interesting and relevant to me is because like my father, so I take care of my dad who adopted me. He's 81. So he was born in like 1939 in like, we're, like raised on a farm in Indiana um, and, and then sort of joined the military uh, in the 50s and 60s. And so he was like, unable to participate in the civil rights movement because he was in the military and like they were like literal like you can't go to a march or else you'll be like arrested by military police or whatever and so um talking to him about these things in the way that like he experienced or didn't experience the struggle for civil rights and kind of pushed towards like assimilating or like kind of hedging his bets in the ways that he could um and the way that i kind of am a troublemaker <laughs> you know i have my knuckles i have dope on my knuckles you know I'm like gangland landlord you know what i mean like we're so different and um thinking about the ways that even though we like our approaches are so different that like this this act of troublemaking you know what i mean of like trying to make trouble as a way of like making a space for freedom right like shaking shit up um in the ways that we can i think that um this book really i don't know it kind of spoke to me and facilitated a lot of that conversation um, so I was really grateful for this book. And I guess I should shout out the people who made it. Um, Eric S. Gelman, uh, and it comes from uh, Chicago University Press. Thank you for sharing that. I want to check that book out. Um, Vanessa or Raquel, was there any book that you felt, or maybe even a lack of, I mean, some of the other things that we've been talking about is sort of like a lack of information about some of these topics. Um, yeah, I, think, I mean, since mo most of my project is like so engaged with archives, um, like in terms of theory, I would say I started um, sort of with just like a theory of space, you know, I just kind of wanted to understand what pr prisons were doing with space. So I looked at Golden Gulag um, by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, Demonic Grounds by Catherine, Mc uh, Catherine McKittrick is like super fundamental to my work anyway. Um, and then I bought this book, uh, Migrating to Prison um, by Jose Cuauhtémoc, I have to look it up. Um, but that actually like really cracked open um, like immigration policy and um, for-profit detention centers, like that it's, it's not even really an ideological issue, it's just, a way of like bringing labor into um, an institutionalized space. Um, and so like the rhetoric enables this extraction of free labor essentially. Um, and, and yeah, just like, I don't know, it, it, the, the whole like system of capital underneath, you know, the prisons um, became really clear. Um, Carceral Capitalism by um, Jackie Wang that one I like read through it really quickly I didn't expect because like the title you're just like oh okay <laughs> okay <laughs> um 
but I actually was just like super engaged and like energized by that book um, because it was just, and that's actually the one that gave me the idea for the graphs um, because she was able to sort of um, create uh, or set the stage for how capitalism sort of co-ops um, difference, identity um, for extraction and also targets difference in identity um, for like predatory lending. And if you're in debt, then that sets you up, that makes you vulnerable to incarceration. So like, it's like a whole, you know, and I, I love a conspiracy theory. <laughs> um, not, not like the, the QAnon stuff. Um, you know, I just, I just really like uh, <laughs> sort of think the, the bare bones of the system. Uh, yeah, no, that not that other one. Yeah, I know every all of us were like, no, but we, we knew what you meant. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just like um, I don't know, ex just exposing uh, the inner workings of like things that are just like, you know, up, up in the ideological space. So those were the those were the texts that really got me through. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna screen share um, a text that was very central to this. Wait, does this allow me to do screen sharing? You should be able to. If it's minimized, it won't like read the file. You have to have the file open. So yeah, basically, since this is being weird. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's an ethnographic study called Informe e Investigación Etnográfico del Presidio Insular de Puerto Rico. Presidio Insular is el Oso Blanco. The Oso Blanco mm. is the name for it, which is how everyone knew it. And it's um, put together by Marina Moscoso Arabi, Arabia, sorry, and um, Aida Belén Rivera Rui. And it's very detailed. Um, it doesn't have like any of the emotional anything <laughs> that would make uh, that goes into the poetry, obviously. Um, so in that sense, right, it's, it is what it is. It's an ethnographic study, but it's very detailed specifically about El Oso Blanco. Um, the problem in general with Puerto Rico is that the, the books that exist, um, one of them very important um, is a sort of memoir by um, Fernando, eh, Fernando Pico who's a very important uh, historian. He's kind of an officialist historian in Puerto Rico. Um, and so I was very reticent to read this because I was like, oh, he's kind of like bound up with um, the formation of Elela in the way it's historicized, and right? He's like the historian they teach in schools type thing, right? So I always was like, oh, but actually he spent many years teaching in prisons and it's, it's a very useful resource. Um, Mm -hmm. And then there are some other books, uh, but I, I found them not as useful. And um, of course, Jackie Wang's Carceral Capitalism is an incredible book. And right, some of these helped me frame my thinking and my approach. But I wanted as much as I could to um, be close to the context here. So, uh, you know, although that helped me understand a lot, right, I wanted to think about also the ways in which um, things were very much marked by colonialism in terms of like circulation and, you know, kind of like framing and how uh, the prison system here was very tied into the way the city, the city was built, right? Into the way San Juan was built. And, and so the things that were similar and the things that were also different. Um, and that I felt required a very specific research um, that other people had done and I took from and wrote poems about. <laughs> yeah. Well, you did an amazing job. I, I'm gonna do something a bit different here. Um, normally I, you know, ask questions, you know, to, to kind of spur the conversation, but I think you all had a great deal of interest and in sort of questions about each other's work. So I just wanna welcome the opportunity if there's somebody, you know, one or two people that wanted to ask about someone else's project or what 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 they read. Um, I obviously have a lot of questions, but I also want this to be beneficial for you all. If you feel that there's something that you know you want to bring up um, to, to another poet. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, I mean, yeah, I y'all know I already fuck with y'all a ton, so I'm like over here like 
so excited about this. But I mean, so, I mean, one of the things, I don't know if you were sitting down, Vanessa, but I was talking to Raquel about how they just like, I got like a, a nice history lesson from them right now, like a lot of new information that was really exciting. And I think, um, you know, like as Raquel just said, like the closeness to the co like of context that we both, that we all had really, I think was so dope because it shows how like the roots of this network are so like no matter what like you go deep through a personal level and we you'll get to a common shared like root uh if that makes sense um and one of the things that really i felt like in yours vanessa was like i learned so much about a system that even like i don't you know there's always so much more but i mean the american carceral system and it's an impact on black people i feel like that's a thing that i know and the way that you connected that first prisoner to khalif that was like you know, that was like, and I, I don't know, I just kind of wanted to ask about that, like, obviously that like, you know, you, you sort of talked about having uh, challenges in terms of like negotiating what you can talk about and like what you felt comfortable speaking about. And I mean, I'll just be transparent. I thought that it was done really well. And, you know, I, like, but I'm just like, that must have been such an like a wild thing, one to discover and uncover and to try to think about how to share this with other folks. Um, mm -hmm. It was so impactful to me. I just love to ask about it. Oh, thank you. I, um, you know, I, you can't really talk about carcerality without engaging blackness, right? Because it's so central to the issue and the problem. Um, but also as a non-black person, um, you know, there's a way that you have to approach the subject um, without, you know, doing that thing that you talked about um, when you were introducing your poems, right? Like starting with the trauma first. You know, and um, I sent one of the graphs or actually two of the graphs to Keith Wilson. And he was like, you're like, you're, you're doing it. Like whether you are aware of it or not, like it's still a disembodied black body. And I was like, oh shit, he's right. <laughs> right, because, and it's like, um, I think like we're meant to do that, right? Like the system sets up that estrangement and it sets up that distance. And so like engaging the topic of carcerality is to like get up close with blackness and like really um, engage it in a way that's like not um, making it a spectacle, right? Um, which like, it's already so central to my work, but in, the, in terms of carcerality, I was just like, none of this um, feels right to me. So as I was like, you know, doing research and like really just like super interrogating and just like beating myself up, like, you know, like how am I even gonna do this? Um, I encountered, you know, the um, Eastern State Penitentiary and in reading about, you know, that prisoner, that first prisoner and like some of their tactics, like Khalif was already so, you know, front of mind yeah. that I was like, this is just a looping system, right. you know? And, um, it just felt like one of the central things I wanted to like address was time. Like, you know, the construct of time in that we think it's like progress and it's like measured the same all the time. But like, you know, Trump was just impeached yesterday. Um, Nancy Pelosi wore the same dress. It's like, we're back at that day. Oh God, I didn't even, I didn't, I've been like so, you know, check in to make sure that there's not a fucking actual revolution happening and then like, <laughs> I'd be out. That's back crazy, out. I feel you like, but like, it was so wild because she wore the same dress. It's the, the only thing that's different is she's wearing a mask and it's like, mm. so this is, this is like another construct of time, right? And what time feels like in the prison and, you know, so I wanted to engage all of that stuff. I, I still feel like it's not right, but thank you for, you know. Yeah, you know. no, I think like you're, there's this thing that like people talk, we sort of, I went to a talk maybe like three years ago, two years ago with, it was Denez and Don Lundy, uh, Don, Don Lundy Martin and uh, Morgan Parker. And um, they were talking about black bodies, right? And this is a thing that like Denez and Morgan, like all of them were like, black people <laughs> you know and it's like this thing that i think especially what you're saying we're conditioned to talk about like bodies in prisons right. but not people in prisons which is the right. power of synex and the power of khalif right like it's like 
the stories, right? And that's what you said too about the people in the detention facilities. This is the first thing that like, it was like really striking. It's like when we say in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, all the problems that come with these like protest movements, we have, we have say her name, say his name. We mm -hmm. have names, we have lives. Have it's nothing. so important, right? It's so important. And I like, yeah, uh, I think that, that that spreadsheet, the accumulation of like, where are these names, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you. Thank you for the, that question and then for your response, Vanessa, because help me also learn a little bit more about some of the challenges that I know came about when individuals were engaging with this, <laughs> this idea and the, the work behind it. Um, Raquel, did you have something that you wanted to ask? I saw you a little bit before the question was asked by Frank. And if uh you... Yeah, I was really interested, Frank, in, in you mentioned right, a great deal of these came from a previous manuscript and I was sort of curious as to like what, um, what changed, you know, like what, what changed in relation to this project? Yeah, um, that's a, obviously that's a great question. Um, so, I mean, the manuscript that I started with was actually like the MFA manuscript that was like mentioned in my bio, right? So I like kind of finished that it's so crazy, like you get it, you're like, oh, I'm finished. But that was in like 2019, right? Um, and so I had what I thought was something that I was going to go take to like shop around and maybe publish. And um, I felt like, you know, I got like advice from people that it was kind of at that place, but then a lot of things changed for me. And like, I mean, just to be like entirely transparent, um, I like entered therapy for the first time and like started, I've been like now like in weekly therapy for like a little over a year. Um, not nah, for real, best thing I've ever done for my life, 100%, you know? Um, but it changed a lot about how I related to my poetry. It changed a lot about how I related to my entire life, right? Um, I wrote this thing about how like, um, I, when trauma is telling you your story, uh, revision is your way to the truth. Right, mm -hmm. like it's like I can, I needed to like revise the, my understanding of my life so that I could have a true understanding of my life. And uh, that meant also revising a lot of the book. Um, and so in some ways it was the literal text of the poems. Um, some of the poems are entirely different. Like they have the title, they have like the sort of intention or the motivation, um, but the, the content and the shape is entirely different because I think, um, and I mean, no shade. I mean, all shade on my MFA program, honestly, but like also like just in general, like they're so um, easily traumatizing to writers of color, right? They're so like, they condition us to do this thing where like write about your suffering, right? Or don't write about your suffering at all because that's played out. And like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, and there's this way where like, uh, you're not allowed to be yourself. You're not allowed to be honest um, because, and like all these like difficult things that, you know, like Vanessa mentioned working through, like, you know, you, you have to work through those things and like shout out and thank God for our friends who can say like, you know, you're, you're getting there, but you're not quite there yet in terms of, for me, I'm undoing my masculinity, right? I'm unlearning this like really like deep rooted systems of like violence of self-betrayal you know what I mean? These kinds of things. Um, and so a lot, taking that and like sort of revising the text to like be more honest to myself, not self-serving, you know what I mean? Um, like those kinds of things for sure. Um, that actually brings me to a question I have for, for both of you. Um, something I like really picked up on in both of your work is that you um, were care careful to always come back to like a space of care and like a space of like humanization, a space of like, you know, small moments, like narratives. Um, Raquel, your um, uh, poem about the flowers, you know, the, it just, it just really takes the brutality of an institutional space and, and adds this life layer. Um, you know, the way that you like sort of talk to the, to the characters in your, in your poems. Um, I, I really felt their presence, you know, I even felt God in the way that you addressed her, you know, like it just, it felt like your poems are peopled. Um, and something I struggle with is like, I just want to punish myself in my poems. <laughs> I just want to like, like bring the rigor and like the critique and um, like, I don't know, I, I just, I just feel like poems are always the space of punishing um, 
because it's like the work that needs to be done, right? It's, it's, um, I don't know, how, how are you bringing in care? How are you bringing in joy and humanness? Um, and what advice do you have for a very sad poet? <laughs> Raquel, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, it's sort of intense to think about the present um, in relation to the past only because, right, that the repetition that you mentioned, um, Vanessa, showed up in many ways for me throughout this project. One of which was that I was reading also about the tuberculosis outbreak um, and the quarantine that was happening inside the prisons, right? Um, and also because I, I instinctively was like, oh my God, we're living in isolation and writing about the carceral system, you know? And at the same time, there are people imprisoned who I can't even like talk to right now because, you know, and they're being exposed. And in this way, it parallels this other temporality and in this other way, it doesn't, you know? And um, I think it was very, um, weird for me because I wanted it instinctively to go to my own personal experience because that's what I tend to do, right? Like, I tend to do when we're told, oh, write what you know, you know? And so um, I wanted to like write about my father in some ways and my grandfather and all this stuff. And then I was like, no, I don't, I don't need to do that for this project. You know, um, what I can do is um, approach from my positionality and and without centering it and and I think that was a struggle for me um, because I don't think there's like a blueprint for how to do that I think we just kind of have to like ask those questions over and over as we're writing mm -hmm. um, and my approach was to be like well I don't know about a bunch of this stuff so I'm gonna learn about all this stuff and I'm gonna think about what's not being said in these texts, because that's what poets do, right? They look at these documents that are written from this like very cold, very distant discourse, and they, they see what's not there, right? They see what's between the lines. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily have to be 100% accurate in everything, but I have to be accurate to the feel, right? I have to be accurate to the life that mm -hmm. is there. And so um, that helped. Um, and I think it helped me feel less lonely in the process because weirdly um, contextualizing myself m reminded me that everybody else was lonely too <laughs> and we were all lonely right and it, and it, and it kind of um, alleviated some of that weight of the loneliness if that makes sense yeah, yeah. I don't know if it helped but... no I mean it was it was so uh, wild writing about, you know, mass incarceration during a pandemic and like a fascist uprising or, yeah. Um, yeah but yeah. What about and you? at the time, like, very present, you know, just, um, I think we need, like, we don't have the necessary distance from the present moment to even begin to parse because things are happening traumatically so quickly mm -hmm. and it feels weird to write about the present but somehow writing about the past helped me deal with it yeah me too mm -hmm. yeah it's been a lot of um like i mean obviously like i think the therapy bit like i started i don't know like the top of the pandemic i was like well okay like i got weekly therapy i don't get to leave the house ramadan was like a month and a half after that so I was like, all right, like this is what I'm doing and I'm just gonna be like reflecting. And I did a lot of like, a lot of, yeah, like digging through my childhood, a lot of writing about the past in order to understand the present. Um, there is a thing that you said, Vanessa, though, like this drive to like punish yourself or to like want to punish. And I like fucking relate to that so heavy, like, you know, like so serious. Like I, one of the big things has been for me is like, I'm working on trying to change like my internal dialogue because like as like sort of what I've been conditioned as a as a man like I'm I've latched on to these men who are like coaches and these kinds of like ways of like trying to tell me to be better by telling me that I wasn't good and like you know um and it's this way that it never brought me closer to what I wanted 
And like in doing so, it also caused me to want to punish others and like be very judgmental or angry at others for not being whatever I expected of them. And um, there was this thing that, uh, so there's this book uh, called The Gift of Death by Jacques Derrida. It's a theory book. It's okay. Derrida. Oh, you you love oh yo that no one ever I, said they love Derrida. No, it's not, <laughs> that's my shit. Like he, yeah, no, he's saying that like the archive will haunt us, but we can never access it because it's unreadable. I fucking love Derrida. Yeah. Okay. Oh. And the whole thing in the gift of death is that like everything you know, like that the story of Abraham isn't about like him proving his loyalty to God by being willing to kill his son. It's God trying to teach him a lesson about the fact that like your death is yours and whatever sacrifices, like every choice is a sacrifice of other options, mm -hmm. right? You can either obey God or you can keep your son, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can't do both. And like in, in doing so, like I, I think that for me, it's started to make me think about when I do something, what am I not able to do because of that? Mm -hmm. um and so like when I come from a place like my first when I write down when I write poems most often my first instinct is like anger and rage it's like these are the people who I'm mm -hmm. mad at <laughs> you know what I mean like and y'all should be different um <laughs> <laughs> you know and then like but then I've like also and I like shout out to the fucking banging my head against the wall in an MFA program for three years trying to write to these white people um and then also like having the illumination of being in isolation like that line about my cousin is real like my cousin has been locked up um for years and he can't come out he's like they like refuse to like you know see his appeals and we can't even you know they have like these tele networks that you're supposed to be able to reach them and send messages and they've been moving like people from prison to prison and shit. like i haven't even been able to talk to him you know not, you know what i mean his own mother can barely like get a hold of him Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like knowing that like I can speak to him or I can try to speak to these other people because I can't effectively communicate to both of them at once. Mm -hmm. And so like for me, it's like in that gift of death, it's like, okay, so who is really in need and who do I feel like I can help? And then bring like in, in terms of like, what do I need? You know, like for me, like I needed to like get to a place where like tenderness is something I'm learning. And like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn how to be gentle. And like, even with people who don't, who aren't gentle with me, you know, and, and that means myself, um, you know, uh, and I think that like trying to build that gentility uh, and to like humanize myself in these poems, I think that's what, that's, that, that's what helps me do it in these other ways. Cause mm -hmm. like, um, what's that pedagogy of the oppressed? It's like, you have to restore humanity to both, to, to the oppressed and to give it back to the oppressor. Um, and so I'm like trying to like restore my humanity and doing so maybe can give humanity back to others. So much to think about. Yeah, I, uh, there's a lot to think about there, you know, and I wanted, I wanted to address, um, you know, what, what you mentioned about the flowers, Vanessa, because it's interesting it, right, I do have a tendency throughout my work to answer, to, to be very much the, um, Right, the um, I don't know how you would translate picado because it's not quite a uh, jester, but there's something of a like, um, like it's like, like a teasing, you yeah, know, like playfulness. Yeah. Um, with with discourse, right? So I tend to incorporate a way of talking about people uh, that's institutional and sort of answer back in a way that sort of fucks with it, right? Yeah. Um, or is very disidentificatory, very to borrow uh, one of my favorite terms from um, Jose Esteban Munoz. But um, you know, part of part of why I opened it with this quote was because uh, I think a lot about the modernization project of Puerto Rico as a beautification project as well, right? As to, to to be able to build this prison that's pretty, that has like an patio right and it's like so you can show it to the world in such a pretty structure um and it obviously contrasts so much with the ruins that it is now like i pass by el uso blanco every day you know mm -hmm. um and and how the sort of the movement of the flowers throughout the piece have a lot to do with the difference between what something's purposed for and what people make of it mm -hmm. right so the flowers were meant to be a beautification 
um, of something ugly, right? And uh, they ended up that that ended up being a space where prisoners grew food that helped them survive during the war years because they didn't have enough food coming in, right? And at the same time, they still kept the flowers up and they had to keep that up, right? They had, they were the ones that planted them. They were the ones that that nurtured them. And especially now, right, um, one of the first things I, I bring to my students in class is I ask them to go interview someone in their family that is an elder that works with plants, because a lot of elders here have worked with plants. And one of the things that's most beautiful to me is that it, that happens across gender lines. Um, you know, you have old men tending for their plants and you have old women tending for their plants and no one feels that that emasculates them, right? Um, so for me, it, it, it made sense as a place to go immediately to think of um, the ways in which uh, connection with the earth, especially in something like a prison where, you know, people are being forced to disconnect from all things that are like the earth or nature or whatever, um, in this context to like be able to grow um, plants was very important. And originally, as part of this project, I was going to work with uh, Elizabeth um, is very, very wonderful artist here. I can, I can also send a link to her work, but um, she's been working with the women's prison in Bayamon for a long time, um, taking earth uh, and plants to the prison and working with the women to like grow things. Um, and it, it's actually very intense because there are certain sorts of like soil and earth that they have to like check and like <laughs> before they can go into the prison. And so uh, a lot of this, right, for me was like both the stark violence of the institution and also just something that that just couldn't be uh, repressed or contained or um, killed off, right, that, that is alive and is there and is right and is and is happening with with imprisoned peoples. Yeah. Um, I, I was so compelled by the, um, what was the term? I was like, penal um, decolonization, like penal. You, can, you can do a small scale decolonization action within the space of the prison, which is like the most colonial structure. Wow. That was just a really beautiful moment. Yeah, and, and at the same time, I critique that, right, and this is probably the last thing I'll say because I feel like I'm taking up too much space, but, um, you know, uh, there's, there's this thing that happens in Puerto Rico on the left, right? Where there's a lot of advocacy for the freeing of political prisoners who fought for the independence of Puerto Rico and a lot of distinguishing them as political prisoners as opposed to the other prisoners, which are not political. And so, <laughs> and so um, I, I really wanted to push against that notion and right, there's also a play on um, this sort of argument, right, that the state is is the criminal or that the government is the criminal that happens a lot in the left, uh, where even when there were like mass arrests of like corrupt politicians, right, there was a, on the part of the federal authorities, there was like a celebration of that in a way. And it was very hard for me because on the one hand, yes, absolutely, these are horrible people that, you know, should be brought to justice, but not not just through the carceral system, right? <laughs> More maybe like the Justice Mussolini guy, right? Um, so my vision of justice, uh, I don't feel corresponds at all uh, to the carceral system. And yet so much of our conversations on the left here are still very structured by that notion that like it is through this system that we're going to um, reach some kind of justice. And I couldn't, I couldn't really um, connect with that. And I wanted to push against it. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for that thoughtful response. Um, I think we're gonna end there. I feel that we can talk so much more about this topic, um, but I think that the key is, is that you brought your whole self to this project and in doing that, you are going to inspire so many more conversations, necessary conversations um, at this really challenging time, challenging, as a euphemism for something else, challenging time in the world. Um, and I just wanna thank you all. You've been amazing. You've inspired me with your work, your dedication. And um, I can't wait to get this online um, so that other people <laughs> can enjoy it aside from us. But I'm just, I'm very grateful. Thank you.